If you've ever tried to interact with the general privacy community and genuinely asked, why should I care about privacy? You probably got slammed with a lot of really extreme answers, like how it can protect you from political retaliation or government oppression or the ideological value of free speech. Now, to be fair, these are all really good points, and there are definitely some people who really do need to prioritize and concern themselves with these things. But for many people, especially people who can access this video, those are all kind of extreme abstracts. Most of us in the West, generally speaking, probably won't ever have to fear being thrown in jail for criticizing the president or having our freedom of speech actually limited via legal mechanisms. Please note that social pressures are not legal mechanisms. So what about that? What about the rest of us who are just trying to live our lives and pay our bills, who aren't super politically active or aspiring celebrities who don't live under super repressive regimes? Should quote unquote normies even care about privacy? Like, do they even gain anything meaningful and tangible for all of the required effort? Yeah, actually, you gain a lot. Privacy and security can be a lot of work. Well, can be being the operative qualifier there. There are definitely some things that seem like a lot of work, but really aren't, like switching your browser. Every browser that I recommend gives you the option to easily import your existing browser data, like bookmarks and extensions, so you might have to log back into things the first time, but other than that, it should be pretty much a one-click fix. And then there's other things that do require some one-time upfront effort, like moving to a password manager, you have to export all your existing passwords out of your browser and import them into the new password manager, and then ideally you should be switching your bad passwords to better ones, so that will take some work even if you break it off into manageable chunks. But again, that's one time up front. Once it's done, you're pretty much smooth sailing from there on out. And then of course, there are things that are actually a lot of work, like switching email providers to an encrypted email provider or switching over to a voice over IP solution. And that's not even including the really advanced stuff that I don't typically talk about, like self-hosting Nextcloud or switching to Linux or other stuff like that. So understandably, once you get past the one-click stuff like switching browsers or even before the one-click stuff, when people look at all the work they might potentially have to do to achieve a reasonable level of privacy, the question most people start asking is, is this worth it? And I think that's a fair question to ask. Like I said in the intro, most normies don't really concern themselves with things like free speech or serious political activism, apart from maybe reposting something on social media and maybe if they're really serious, attending the occasional protest. And most of them probably don't think too much about cybercrime because most of them only frequent a handful of trusted websites like Amazon or Facebook and think that they're just not a very appealing target. Side note, I have 100% addressed this in a previous video about data breaches. For those who haven't seen it and don't want to suffer through my horrible production quality from my early days, the short version is you may not be an interesting target, but you may be using services who are interesting targets like Amazon or Facebook, and therefore you may end up as collateral damage in a data breach. There's more information in the video if you really want to learn more. But the longer I go through my privacy journey, the more I start to notice that there are actually other benefits to privacy and security aside from these crazy abstracts, like the cops not being able to illegally search my device or being able to freely speak my mind. I especially notice this because, believe it or not, the vast majority of people around me don't really care about this stuff, or at least not nearly as much as I do. So I can't help but notice the things that they struggle with that don't impact me because of the privacy and security choices I've made. I also have the benefit of hearing people's feedback once I'm able to convince someone to switch and actually commit to using a privacy tool and then hearing them say, wow, this is so nice. Here's the benefit that I'm noticing. So without further ado, I'd like to share five of the benefits that I've either noticed myself or heard other people make note of when it comes to using privacy and security tools in their life that aren't directly related to privacy and security. Please note this is not a complete list, nor is it in any particular order. I just thought five was a nice number that would make both viewers and the YouTube algorithm happy. As if YouTube is ever happy. Are you happy? I've never been happy. Benefit number one, you will never forget a password again. One of the tools I've been most successful in getting people to switch to is using a password manager. This is, probably unsurprisingly, actually an easy sell. I'm not going to spend forever going into all the problems with passwords, most of us are probably aware of them, and for the average person, passwords are an absolute nightmare. Cue the password manager. The password manager is the one tool that I've never had anyone come back to me afterward and go, yeah, I tried it out, but I ended up not using it. Every single person I've ever convinced to try out a password manager has come back to me later and gone, oh my god, how did I live without this before? This is life-changing and it's made things so easy. For those new to password managers, I do have a video about that too. But the short version is that it's a secure place to record all of your login information. Stuff like username, email, login link, password, even a notes section which can be used for stuff like answers to security questions or whatever other information you might need for that particular website or service. 
The benefits of these things are astronomical. It can take you straight to the login page in one click. You can fill out the password also with one click instead of having to type it out and get it wrong. You can generate passwords on the spot to easily and quickly meet the website's password requirements. Some password managers even help you generate random usernames. And of course, the big thing is that you will never have to remember another password or waste your time with another password reset. And then of course, there's the security benefits, like being able to create unique complex passwords for every website to avoid credential stuffing, the fact that going straight to the login page can help protect against phishing, and more. Now, of course, in the interest of nuance, I have to note that there are risks with password managers, like how you're putting all your eggs in one basket, and not all of them are created equal. <coughs> Last pass. So I'd strongly encourage you to take a look at my page about password managers to learn which password managers to avoid and the best ways to secure your password manager to keep all of that information as safe as possible. And while we're at it, you should take a look at my page about two-factor authentication to make sure you're protecting your accounts as much as possible, including your password manager. Benefit number two, ads will become rare, almost non-existent. I've been using ad blockers, mostly uBlock Origin, for years. But sometimes in my day job, it's common for people to use their computers to test a system. They plug it in and they play something off YouTube to see if we can hear it and see it. And usually those people don't have any ad blockers installed. And the difference is absolutely night and day. This is especially true with visiting like news sites or really any websites, health websites, shopping sites, even search engines. And if you've never used an ad blocker before, you're probably sitting here going, well, ads aren't that bad. The company has to make money somehow. But the thing is, you're probably just used to it. My wife and I started dating. Hulu ads were only 30 seconds long for most breaks. Now they are well over two minutes. When I started listening to podcasts years ago, most ad breaks were only 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Now they're at least two, and I've heard some as long as three and a half. This is how every platform naturally progresses. They start small so you're not bothered by it, and then they slowly crank it up since you don't seem to care. This is not going to be an appeal about why ads are bad or invasive, though they are. This is a video about non-privacy related benefits to adopting a privacy lifestyle and going ad free for free is one of those benefits. If you're one of those people who thinks I don't mind the ads, I wanna challenge you. Go try out an ad blocker for 30 days or even two weeks. While you can do this by switching to a browser like Brave, I'm not even gonna challenge you to do that much because allegedly that's a lot of work to switch a browser, right? Instead, I'm gonna make this as easy as possible. Just go straight to the link in the video description and add uBlock Origin to whatever browser you're currently using. Now, we'll say if you're on mobile, you may have no choice but to switch to Brave. Like I said, give it a month or even just two weeks. Just add that extension and go about your life for the next two weeks and then remove uBlock afterwards and tell me if you don't notice how much nicer the internet was with an ad blocker installed. I bet you'll be on my side. You'll be like, wow, I cannot believe how many ads are everywhere. As a bonus, you can also configure uBlock Origin or Brave Shields to block things like those cookie consent banners, newsletter signups, and other annoying pop-ups. Now, keep in mind that this will only work on your browser. So if you're the kind of person who uses the app for literally everything, then you may not notice a difference. But if you use your web browser a lot, you'll probably see the difference right away. Also, this is a little off topic, but it does need to be said. If you are the kind of person who uses like a billion apps, you really shouldn't. The more apps you have, the more data is being collected about you through those apps, and also the more at risk your phone is from a security perspective. I encourage you to delete the apps that you don't use very often, and out of the remaining ones, switch to a browser or a progressive web app where you can. Benefit number three, so will spam. Like, become rare, I mean. Now this one takes a lot of work and intentionality. Unlike the first two benefits, this won't happen overnight or easily, and it does require you to be willing to integrate some of the more advanced strategies I recommend, like using voice over IP numbers, alias email addresses, and disinformation. But if you start using this stuff at even a basic casual level, specifically the first two, you'll soon start finding that you're getting a lot less spam than you used to. Like, a lot less. I have a coworker who gets at least one spam call almost every day, usually more. And with this being an election year, robotexts and calls are about to get a lot worse. Even with all the effort I put in, I usually get around 10 or so spam texts during the last few months leading up to the election day. But that's total, not per day. For most people, it's far worse than that. Even with non-election years, most of the people around me still get a few spam calls a month at least, sometimes a few a week. That one coworker I mentioned, I think my record with him was like three or four in a day. As in, I watched him get three to four spam calls in the eight hours we worked together that one single day. I assumed that that pace continued after we clocked out and the next day. Like I said, this one takes time. It's not you just sign up for simple login or a non-addy and suddenly you won't get any more spam. But if you start using these services now and you start getting a lot more disciplined about who gets your information and what information they get, I'd say probably within a few months, you'll be the person in the room when your coworker is angrily hanging up thinking to yourself, wow, I just realized I haven't had one of those spam calls in ages. And again, I wanna make it very clear that this doesn't eliminate all spam calls and texts, but it seriously reduces them to like a fraction of what it used to be. And at that point, the ones that make it through are just funny. 
Like the one time I got a text from Black Democrats for Ohio. I am none of those things. Okay, benefit number four, theft, loss, and damage become less of a concern. Take a moment right now to pause and ask yourself a serious question. How screwed would you be if you just realized you left your phone on a bus in a rough part of town? I mean, sure, maybe you have Find My Phone enabled and you can track it down or maybe even remotely wipe it. But I mean, we're talking about it's been lost for hours and you just now realized it. Do you even have a passcode on there? Is it a good passcode or is it like 1111? Is the lock photo of your kids or some revealing piece of information about yourself, maybe your work? And if they did manage to unlock it, what's on there? Is your bank app on there? Is your credit card stored in the wallet app? What's in your text history or in your photo roll? On a less malicious and scary note, what about just damage? Like what if you dropped your phone in the toilet and it's gone for good? Rice can only fix so much. Is there stuff on there that you don't have anywhere else? Or if your computer hard drive just died tomorrow without warning, do you have backups? This is a true story I've shared before. Once I was working at a conference and I set down my backpack while I did some other stuff. When I went to retrieve it later, it was gone. I spent the next couple hours hunting down everyone I could and asking if they'd seen it or maybe grabbed it by accident. And with no other recourse, I simply let security know that it was lost, possibly stolen, and to contact me if anyone turned it in. Now, as an audio guy, that's a $1,500 gaming laptop because I use it for production. And now I needed to replace it with no warning. But more importantly, I was a freelancer back then, which means that my laptop was chock full of things like contracts, social security numbers, bank numbers, contact information, dates, addresses, and more. But honestly, I was really only worried about replacing the laptop. And that's not because I'm some kind of selfish, heartless jerk who only thinks about money. It's because ever since I got into privacy, my laptop is full disk encrypted using a good passphrase. Nobody except the NSA is getting into that disk without my passphrase. And even the NSA is questionable on that count. Rubber hose attacks not included. I knew that the data itself was safe from any kind of thief. And furthermore, I make backups of my data at least once a month. I think once a week back then. So I knew that whatever data I just lost was at most only a week old. The overwhelmingly vast majority of my documents and files were still safe at home. And once I got a new computer, I could be back up and running with all my files in just a day. When you use good passphrases, encrypt your devices, and keep good backups, you never really have to worry about your data. You can rest assured in the knowledge that if you ever lose a device, nothing sensitive is going to fall into the wrong hands, and it won't be more than a temporary setback or a minor inconvenience for you because you have copies stored elsewhere. For more information on this particular topic, check out the passwords, backups, and device encryption pages on my website. Oh, and for those curious, my laptop story has a happy ending. Basically, one of the organizations attending the conference thought that my backpack was part of their bags because it was black and nearby. Not really nearby, but whatever. Regardless, that same night when they were packing up to leave, they realized their mistake. They turned it into the security desk, who in turn called me. It was not fun to drive back there at midnight, but I was happy to have my laptop back. So no harm, no foul. And finally, benefit number five, you will have more emotional bandwidth or spoons if you're a spoon theory kind of person. A big part of privacy, at least my personal way of approaching it, which I also recommend at least to some degree to others, involves simply not putting your data out there in the first place. As such, that also means being less digitally connected, fewer apps, fewer accounts, fewer devices. As such, that means that there's a lot of stuff you just miss in a good way. You'll miss a lot of the stupid drama on social media. You'll miss a lot of the unimportant news from the 24 seven news cycle. For the record, I do encourage you to find a healthy way to responsibly stay updated on major events. That's part of being a good citizen of society. But let's be honest, that stuff can be really depressing and overwhelming sometimes. And it's not healthy to be immersed in it constantly. Because privacy encourages you to disconnect as much as possible, that means you can far more easily avoid things that will drain you emotionally and mentally without giving you anything in return. And instead, it frees you up to focus on the things that you'd rather spend your time doing and that you get fulfillment out of. Even if those other hobbies are electronically based, like playing video games or watching movies or reading on tablets, odds are that you're doing them intentionally as opposed to just mindlessly doom scrolling in bed for hours because of inertia and letting life just happen to you passively. The end result is still the same. You spend more time doing intentional things that bring you joy instead of passively absorbing whatever the algorithm throws at you that ends up taking a lot out of you. And when all is said and done, you have nothing to show for. So that is my list of five privacy benefits that aren't privacy related. If you're new to this stuff or hesitant to try out some privacy stuff, I hope this video has given you a push and helped you see that there's a lot more to this stuff than meets the eye. If you're a privacy veteran, leave a comment and let me know some other benefits that you think I've missed or that you have noticed in your own privacy journey. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.